So um, again, my name is Amber Brooks. Um, I am a, an anesthesiologist and pain medicine physician in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, for those who are joining us outside of North Carolina. And I am one of the members of uh, a group called the Cape MD. So that number four is a play on, a, on the letter A. Um, and it makes up myself, uh, Dr. Tamika Knox, Dr. Lakeisha Legree, uh, and Dr. Christian, Kristen Trillier Jackson, Jackson. We're all really close friends. And um, a few months ago, uh, we decided that we were going to walk in our full purpose and come together as a collective group to use our voices to, um, to fight against everything um, that has to do with health disparities, especially in communities of color, and to support uh, initiatives around women's health. So we thank you so much for um, joining us. We have a really, really special guest today with us. Um, Michael Brooks, who also happens to be uh, my husband. My husband uh, is an awesome dude, and he also is an associate professor at North Carolina A&T uni uh, State University. Uh, he's a licensed um, counseling professional, and he also sits on the licensing board for counselors in North Carolina. So we're really pleased to have him with us today to discuss this really important issue of um, dealing with racial injustice and police brutality. So before we start, um, we are going to take 60 seconds of silence in honor of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and Ahmaud Arbery. As well, of, as well as all of the other persons who have suffered as a result of racial injustice and police brutality and who have lost their lives. So if you all would just take a moment of silence with us for 60 seconds. Thank you. All right, thank you all. So I'm gonna start with a personal story. So Mike and I were talking last week. Um, and for those who have recently joined us, we are recording, so please turn off your cameras and also mute yourself. So Mike and I were having a conversation um, last week and I looked at Mike and I said, Mike, do you have hope that we will see real change in our lifetime? Um, my husband is like a really optimistic person. Um, so I think I was expecting an optimistic response. Uh, and instead he looked at me and he said, Amber, I don't think about hope. I think about just trying to stay alive and survive. And um, y'all, that really shook me to my core um, because this, here's this fearless leader of my family, someone that I admire, um, who represents such strength to me. And so for him, to, for me to hear him say that he didn't even think about hope um, really just broke my heart. And I know that um, Dr. Tamika, Dr. Lakeisha uh, and Dr. Kristen are also married to um, black men who are also well accomplished. Um, they also have children. A um, couple of them have black sons. And so we all collectively were feeling um, really helpless and hopeless last week. Um, and so I would, I would let any of them chime in um, 
and and add their at their stories too. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Kristen. Um, I think that for me, one of the biggest struggles that I've been having as um, a black woman, as the mother of a black son, as the wife of a black husband or a black man, um, I think for a lot of us, the feeling of exhaustion um, and frustration is really at the forefront right now. Um, and while we all need to protect our mental health and our mental space, um, but one thing that I've been struggling with is a balance between doing that, but also continuing to engage. Um, I know for a lot of people, they feel like they shouldn't have to explain it, um, explain their perspective or explain what it feels like, um, especially to people who aren't Black. Um, but I have been challenging myself to continue to engage, not with everyone, but specifically with people who engage with me and have an open heart and say, look, I, I really don't agree, but I want to understand better. Um, and I think the important thing is to really discern who to engage with. I'm not engaging on Facebook anymore. I'm not engaging on social media because people don't come to listen um, on social media. Um, but I have had close friends who are not Black reach out to me and say, hey, when I heard Black Lives Matter, I used to scream out all lives matter, but I want to understand. And I think that there really are people who come from a place where they don't get it, but they want to. And those are the people that we need to continue to engage with um, because we need um, as many allies as we can get. So that's been a hard thing for me is to continue to keep my heart open because I am upset, I am frustrated, I am exhausted mentally, emotionally, all over the place. Um, but that's just been my, so, my struggle. Dr. Kristen, I think you bring up a really um, good point and that was gonna be one of our points of discussion today about how to engage with people who have who are not Black, who um, have an interest in becoming an ally, and how do you balance that with your own, wanting to protect your own mental well-being, your own emotional well-being? How do you balance with that, with the sense of urgency, you know? Yeah. It, for me, I feel like, yes, I could provide um, a, an ally or a friend or an acquaintance with a list of resources, but honestly, the time is now, you know, we don't necessarily have time for someone to go read a book and then come back and have a discussion in two months. This is a time sensitive thing. So, um, Mike, I'm wondering if you have some tips or strategies about how, about how to engage, effectively engage allies while protecting your, your own emotional well-being. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, Again, let me let me thank the KPMDs for allowing me to to spend some time with you all tonight. Um, um, I received a lovely invitation from my wife, so uh, I'm glad to to be here with you all and talk to you all about kind of like Bob and Toad. You kind of got Bob and Toad, huh? Yeah, and and talk to you all about um, about mental health and and uh, and good mental health. I want to go back to something Kristen said briefly, though, you know, it's, I think we need to understand that we shouldn't have a normal response to something that abnormally happens. Um, it's not, unfortunately, it's not going to be every day or too often that we um, see someone die in front of us um, in such a horrendous way. So I think we should have an abnormal response to that. We should be shocked. We should be hurt. We should be upset. We should not feel right. Um, 
mixed with the historical trauma that black folks have been exposed to uh, for decades and generations and centuries, uh, it's okay. It really is okay to, to just cry out and cry out often. And I think we should give ourselves permission to do that until we feel like we've been, we've been uh, 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 purged of whatever bad feelings we have. Um, and I think you're right as well, Amber, you know, we do have the opportunity to engage and some of us may feel well enough to engage. I think that may be the second point. Um, we, we have to monitor ourselves and kind of see where we are and allow ourselves to engage accordingly. So that, that may be laced with mistakes and you may get tripped up by anything, uh, how are you doing today? What, you know, how do you think I'm doing? Anything could, could cause a reaction. And again, that's all normal. But if all of that has been addressed and it's been settled, I think, um, I think uh, there, there are two sides to engaging with potential allies. Um, I can tell you what I would do. I would want to tell anyone that this is not gonna be a quick fix. Um, we didn't get here overnight, and it's, as, as fast or, or as much as we want this to be over, it's not going to go away tomorrow. So for me, I'm looking for people who are going to invest. I'm looking for people who are going to be at least willing to engage in difficult and tough dialogues um, where feelings may be uh, in jeopardy, um, Hurt feelings may be expressed, but honesty will also be conveyed. And if we can establish those base rules, then we start to talk about, okay, I'm angry. Let me tell you what I'm going to do. And we get to the doing part. Um, and we just always engage in some aspect of doing. I, I, I'm a real fan of history. I appreciate history. I talk about history and everything I do. So if I'm engaging with someone, we're gonna talk about how we historically got to this place so we can at least have some type of knowledge base. But at the same time, we're talking about doing. Um, when you hear injustice being spoken in front of you, what do you do? Uh, if you don't know how to recognize injustice, what are you doing to increase your knowledge? Um, and then it's about doing this on a regular basis because that's easier said than done they're going to be some back and forth where you're going to challenge close friends, close relatives. You're going to be on your job and you're going to hear some things. You may think that your employment's in jeopardy. So this is a process. And then it's the, if, if you're a white person, you know, you have the privilege of turning this on and off. So we can move into empathy and understanding that black people don't have an on and off. They don't have a, let me get a break for this. I mean, we can go on vacation and we still have to deal with racism. We can go out of the country and we still have to deal with being judged. And, you know, everyone can have all the success they want, but in certain eyes, you're still going to be this thing. So that's, those are the entry level steps to me about where these, this conversation can go for potential allies. Um, but I think that's a fairly decent place to start. So, Mike, I would follow up. So, thank you for that. Um, and I would I would agree with that. What? So, I have a much easier time engaging allies who have been there for the for the ride. I have a I have much more personally. I have a much more challenging time for um, for you know, people who have voiced their frustrations. It's like, I've known you for seven years. We've lived in this town for seven years. You have never engaged me in any type of in-depth conversation beyond the superficial. And now here you come sliding into my DMs or to my text message or email offering support. And while I'm appreciative, the other part of me is like, where have you been? Yeah, yeah. How yeah. how would you? What are you, what are your recommendations or advice for for handling that? Yeah, yeah. No new friends. I get you. Um, 
Yeah, I, I, you know, there's enough divisiveness going on, and I can appreciate someone who comes into awareness. Um, I think it says a lot for someone to have the humility to say, look, I've changed my ways. I've, I've erred in the past, and I'm looking to do something different. And I mean, I, I use all of that. I say, well, tell me the ways in which you've erred. Tell me all the opportunities where you could have done something different. And let's use that. Let's, let's, let's push that forward. Um, I'm sure, as you all know, there's several different types of clients. You know, they're, they're the ones who are mandated, who may just come because, you know, if you deal with substance abuse, the judge said you have to come. And so they're mad at everyone, the officer that arrested them, the bad attorney that misrepresented them the judge that gave them a harsh sentence. And then it's the one who says, you know what? I got arrested for a DUI, but there were at least 20 times where I should have been arrested. And I can think of the times where this substance abuse has affected my family and my job. I need help. So I went ahead. I didn't wait to go to treatment. I went ahead and started asking myself, how many times have I messed up? So I can appreciate, I can appreciate someone who's walking in to a new, a new life, and they've had a cathartic moment. I, I can, I can roll with that. Um, now, I will say, you know, you won't burn me twice. So um, that th that conversation may need to be had. Look, let's just make sure that that we're being sincere here. But I, I don't. I think the problems are too great um, in our society to totally uh, stiff arm someone for the long haul. And, and that may be more of my hurt if I say I, I needed you before you weren't here. And I do think, you know, there is a, um, an orientation to black people. I think you need to know our hurt as a collective group. So, you know, in the Academy, we're notorious, maybe not, not at A&T, but at other places, you know, other places, the Academy is notorious for going into communities uh, reaping them of their resources and kind of leaving. And so black folks are kind of saying enough with that. And I think, I think we're saying that in so many ways, if we say you saw me in this, in this place of hurt and you walked by or you turned your head or you didn't offer this when I needed that. So I think that's, that's fair, but, uh, but a permanent stiff arm may be something that I would encourage encourage someone to reconsider. Thank you. So um, we're going to uh, shift gears a little bit, and I'm going to let Dr. Tamika ask a question. And if you have so, questions in the chat, please go ahead and post them. We're, we're reading them at the same time, I think. Yes, we are. <laughs> so um, Dr. Michael, one of the things that I think um, is a huge deal in the African American community is the taboo about mental health and counseling. Can you kind of talk about that? Yes. Um, so, just like uh, Amber, my wife, hinted at before, the relationship between the counseling or psychotherapy community and, and and black people hasn't always been the best. Um, and that's for a number of reasons. And it's gotten better uh, as there are more black professionals and there are more uh, places where black people are trained and where research regarding uh, black people has improved and allow the stories of black people to be told. There have been competencies um, that have been established. Now the sad part is we need competencies in the first place but it's gotten better. I think the best uh, or the most ground that the counseling profession has gained has really come from the church. Um, if, if counseling gets an endorsement from the pulpit, then people will kind of see that as a vouch for counseling. Um, and equally so, if the pulpit uh, speaks ill of counseling, then sometimes that can be one of our largest barriers. Um, we can go all the way back to the Tuskegee experiment to, to see how helping professionals or the helping profession has misused and, mis and, and mistreated black people. And like we said, you know, we haven't forgotten that. So 
um, I, I tell my students that we have a, a, real, a real sense of arrogance about ourselves in some ways because we get licensed, we hang a shingle, and we just assume that people are gonna hop in their cars, drive across town or catch a bus or whatever, and just fill their guts because we're in business. So it's, it's, it's equally important for the counselor to adjust and position themselves so that people are comfortable opening themselves to us as much as we are uh, uh, being available to them. So it's better. It's better, but we still have work to do. We have work around stigma. Um, we, we still think that if you go to a counselor, you're crazy. Um, and we do that sometimes in our own circles. Um, there's still a cost around counseling that seems a little out of bounds. Um, so maybe counselors need to incorporate more insurance work in their, in, in their practice. Um, I think that's a little debatable, but it, it's worthy of discussing. Um, organically, counseling is established by white men, practiced on and normalized uh, on white men. So it takes a very conscientious counselor to see that I'm doing work that's been founded in another completely different demographic, yet it's supposed to work or, or be receptive by this other group. So we're, we, like I said before, we started developing uh, uh, culture-based theories. We have culture-based techniques. Um, I think this, the, the more uh, savvy therapists are able to find ways to make counseling fun and, and, not, uh, and not taboo and mysterious. Um, so it, it's gotten better. I can say that with confidence. Dr. Michael, your wife, Dr. Amber, says this a lot. You got to meet people where they are. And you just kind of said that we have to meet our patients where they are. And I think that that's one of the reasons why we wanted to do this chat is because we know people are hurting. We see people are hurting every day. And so I think that trying to take away that stigma is a huge deal. Yeah. One, one thing that I get is, you know, I have this thing called FM stereo. Like people don't want to be talked to an FM stereo. People don't want to, people don't want to feel like they're on a TV show and you're doing something that's very typical. People want to feel like you're being authentic and you're incorporating a bit of who they are into your interactions. So I think that takes some level of consideration and some level of, of care. So I, I, I teach that, um, Thankfully, I work at a place where, where those happenings can happen often, um, and we try to permeate that belief throughout the world. So, so hopefully it's spreading if it's not already where you are. Thank you. I just want to remind everyone that we are recording, so please mute yourselves and please turn your cameras off. Um, Dr. Lakeisha, I wanted to... Um, wanted to invite you into the conversation because I know this is an area that you speak about a lot too. Yes. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Amber, for um, tagging me in. Uh, I'm Dr. Lakeisha Legree, everyone. And um, uh, the CAPEMD uh, piggybacking off what Dr. Michael just talked about with respect to the stigma, that is one of the basic foundations as to why the four of us ladies who have about 40 years of friendship between the four of us, in addition to 40 plus years of medical training, decided to come together because in addition to mental health, there are multiple medical issues that um, are discussed differently, present differently, and quite frankly, should be treated and addressed differently when you're talking about the minority patient, in particular, the Black patient. And so specifically when it comes to mental health or mental illness, I like to distinguish the two, uh, mental illness in the form of depression and PTSD, because I think that comes into play here. 
the stigma associated with counseling in general is huge in the black community because of historically our faith or uh, our religion or our spirituality. And I also just like to preface my statements by saying I believe that religion is different from spirituality. But many of us are raised to uh, believe that prayer is the end all be all you just continue to pray if it's not going away you pray harder you pray longer you pray differently and i think what many people in our community need to um, be aware of is although prayer is essential in your household depending upon your household or some form of spirituality is essential to healing there are multiple medical studies that show that anyone who has a faith base or a spirituality base and a positive or optimistic attitude can increase their healing time and decrease or shave time off of their hospital stay and their financial impact with respect to their hospital costs. And so it goes the same with respect to mental illness. Um, so I believe that's an important piece, but at the same time, I also believe that our community needs needs to recognize and appreciate the resources such as counseling, such as pharmaceuticals, that you combine with your faith, with your spirituality to help you to heal because it's definitely a process. So in terms of the stigma, I agree with Dr. Michael that um, the pulpit or the church needs to give more of a platform to counseling in addition to spirituality, but also to people who professionally have quote unquote made it with whatever success means to you we need to do more or a better job of being transparent ourselves and so that's the sort of reasoning behind the kpmd and um, as far as being transparent what i mean is not glossing around or hopscotching around the issue of mental illness to say that you're in support of counseling, you're in support of therapy, but telling your story, right? Anybody who's successful has a story to tell. Anybody who's successful has tripped over a few stones. So share how you tripped over that stone, how perhaps you found yourself sitting in a counselor's chair and how perhaps you learned the lesson and then applied that later on to become what society sees you as today. Um, a lot of times I feel like children see certain images and they see the final result, but they don't see the journey. And hence, that's where they lose the lessons on the importance of resources like counseling and just that grit and resilience altogether. So um, I think more of us uh, within the Black community need to be transparent, need to tell your stories because... I really firmly believe that all it takes is one and then it becomes a domino effect and eventually the uncomfortable feelings of being true and telling your truth will kind of fade away and other people will follow suit like dominoes. Thank you. So Dr. Lakeisha, you mentioned um, something, um, I think you mentioned briefly about PTSD and I wanted to circle back around from a earlier um, comment that we have um, from someone in the um, group chat, and she says, um, you know, in my field, I find a lot of a lot of us don't truly know that we are walking around with PTSD um, due to seeing all of these murders. The stress from the daily grind, while also dealing with these events and being able to perform in the in the workplace or real world, is really extreme right now. Um, I, I can totally identify with that, and I'm sure many people who are on this Zoom chat tonight can identify with the added burden of um, knowing the atrocities that have happened. Um, I myself have not watched the George Floyd um, video. I know my limits. Mike will tell you I don't watch any movie that's violent um, because it is... I, I, I have nightmares really easily. Those types of things are really triggering to me. And so I have not watched the video and yet I still, I still feel the weight of this. And yet we are supposed to show up in our daily lives, whether that's our professional lives or whether that's our home lives. And we're still expected to be okay and to smile and to perform 
as if nothing's going on. And, you know, and then occasionally you get a pat on the back and it's like, are you okay? And sometimes you don't. And then we come home, right? So, you know, and to Dr. Lakeisha's point in, in, um, point, in full transparency, obviously I'm married to a licensed um, counselor. Um, and even before I was married to him, I believed in, in counselor uh, counseling. I believed in the synergy of, um, of my faith in God and also that God has given me tools um, to use that are at my disposal for me to stay whole and to stay well. And um, in full transparency, I have my appointment tomorrow and she's going to get a whole mouthful out of me because I have a lot of things to process with what, what, what was all has been going on for the last, um, for the last couple of weeks. Real quick, Amber, just to, um, not to be realist, but I think it's important and thank you for that comment about PTSD. And I'm sure Dr. Mike can um, chime in and give us some additional information. Um, but what I think is important is education, right? Um, I just full transparency am an anesthesiologist just like um, Dr. Amber is and just like Dr. Kristen is and I found myself in the mental um, health space um, personally because of what the young lady who so eloquently commented about was that you deal with various stressors in your life um, inclusive of work stressors and that you find yourself attempting to manage everything or keep from dropping a ball and you find yourself under immense stress, which then leads to burnout, which then leads to clinical depression. And in a lot of professions, particularly high demand, high functioning professions, um, there is no time to say or take five minutes to say, hey, I need to take care of myself. I mean, as physicians, we barely have days off to go to a physical exam appointment. Um, we do that on our post call days off or unless you're in private practice. So um, my um, new job, so to speak, is an alternative wellness center where I treat people with depression and PTSD who are professionals who don't have time to wait six to eight weeks for antidepressant to kick in. We use an anesthetic actually called ketamine that works literally in one to two weeks. But I say all that to say, um, there are people walking around who think they can handle it and they don't recognize they can't handle it until they've smacked right in front of that brick wall head first. And because of suicides in physicians, um, particularly a colleague, this, this wellness center was born. And same with post-traumatic stress disorder. And doing research about that, every Black America, in my opinion, has PTSD, whether you're on the left end of the spectrum with just a little bit or whether you're on the far right end of the spectrum. And I think for other cultures and other races to really understand, you have to do what Dr. Michael was talking about, which is educate yourself from a historical perspective and don't rely on the media or social media to feed you what our history is. Take time to look it up yourself. Um, in fact, in a couple of days, I'm going to disseminate sort of a historical kind of seven minute clip on what Black America's why is, but only since 2015. So if you can imagine over 400 years of incidents that have created our why, then you'll get a snapshot as to the frustration and, and some people the anger and where it's all stemming from. Um, so I say all that to say, people need to understand that repetitive, um, repetitive exposure to things, negative things, like Dr. Amber was talking about, scary movies. Well, every time Black America sees an incident on social media or sees something on the news, whether it's CNN, whether it's Fox, whether it's MSNBC, we are reliving a trauma. Those are secondary traumas. Those are micro traumas. Every time for example, Amber and I went to the University of Iowa for medical school. Uh, most medical school classes are over 100 people. Uh, she and I were probably one of maybe three 
black people in our class. So that in and of itself mm -hmm. is a little bit traumatizing, trying to acclimate yourself to a new environment. If you're in corporate America and you're a C-suite executive and you're one of very few or maybe the only one and you might be, you know, getting coffee and you hear a comment and that comment stings you, instead of walking away, address it at that time, have that tough conversation, take the risk of possible what people might think is job suicide to educate. So it's like those small things that you have to be aware of when you are exposed to it create symptoms of PTSD. But because it's sort of the norm of Black America, we don't think is abnormal. So, um, Dr. Michael, we had a question from the group. How do we support the young Black people who are very angry? Yeah. So as both you and Mike attended Historically Black College and University, Tamika is a graduate of Spelman, Mike is a graduate of Morehouse, both in Atlanta. And we had a question about how do we support young people in their um, frustrations? How do we help them channel that? Yeah. So <clears throat> uh, I think first it's important to recognize the, the, uh, the historical presence of young people in most movements, um, the Children's March in, in Birmingham um, took place in 1963. Um, the Children's March, I believe it was in, in Soweto in 1973 or 68. I forgot one of those two years. The children have always been out in front. The young people have always pushed the agenda when it when it comes to change. So I, I think you have to understand that they are going to say something and do something that needs to be acknowledged. Um, I think the way you support them is to validate their feelings. Um, it's to say what you are seeing is real and honest and, and true. So I would, I would first do that. I think and ask them, what do you need? Uh, what do you need from us? What, how can we best support you? And I think, I think also to be nurturing, um, how can we keep you safe? Um, how, how young people are much more valuable uh, when they're in the fight, when they're in the protest, as opposed to being put away. Um, so I think we, th there's a happy medium for that. Uh, those would be the, the two go-tos that, that I would, that I would much, uh, that I would promote. Um, I create a space for, for my young people. I remember there was some unreadiness um, when, when Mr. Trump was, was elected president and my students came to me and said, we're not ready for class. This, we're just not ready, we're, we're, we're bothered. So mm -hmm. I chose to listen and, and just open up the classroom so we could just talk openly about the series of events and, and kind of not necessarily where do we go from here, but just we could just pour out. Um, and I think we all needed that. I, and I, I'm, I was glad that they felt comfortable coming to me. And I was, they thanked me for listening and not trying to shove down some lecture that, that didn't have much relevancy in the, in, in the present moment. So I, I think that's what I would, well, what I would suggest doing. Yeah, so I have a, um, a story and, you know, the day after Trump was elected, um, I had a female uh, black medical school student who was rotating with me and everybody around us in clinic seemed really unbothered. Um, and she and I were like traumatized. We had not slept the night before. And um, she's like, Dr. Brooks, I'm here, but I'm not really here. And um, so she and I just took a moment and I played a song for her. And I, I told her, I said, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna get through this day. Um, and like, like Mike was saying, just trying to, to support them in any way, first acknowledging their pain, um, acknowledging um, that they're hurting, um, and, and just letting them know that, that we're there. But, you know, that also takes its toll on 
on you as the individual, especially I feel like as black women who are so nurturing um, and women in general who are so nurturing when we have to um, not only try to fill our own cup, but we're also trying to um, take care of all of those around us, you know, for, as, for me as a physician, taking care of my patients, taking care of my mentees, taking care of my students, it's a lot. I mean, it, it, is, it is a lot. Well, I think uh, I think unfortunately being black in America is 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 the burden and and also the blessing that that we have to shoulder, uh, especially if we're going to be conscious blacks. Um, and I, I think I think that's another thing that the allies can do is is just validate that what we're seeing and feeling is legitimate and real. Um, I, I think you co-sign indirectly. On, on racism and racist acts when you ignore them happening right in front of you. So I'm, I'm always one to say, look, you may not know what to do. You may not have the plans and you may not be able to protest um, and, and, and be radical, but you can at least say, hey, I see, I see you and I see what you're going through. And, 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 and that may be enough. So I wanted to um, address one of the comments in the chat um, because I think it's really important. And just to summarize, um, there was a comment about, um, you know, engaging allies, you know, the challenge of engaging our allies is that there um, is oftentimes a lack of shared historical knowledge. You know, Mike and Dr. Tamika and I were talking about this the other night as we were prepping for this. And, you know, black, there, black murders and black atrocities is nothing new. Now, I mean, this is nothing new. And so we were having this conversation. In fact, I was reminding Mike how he took our, at the time, one-year-old to a Black Lives Matters protest. I did not know this is where they were going, but he took my baby to a Black Lives Matters protest on his shoulders just four years ago. And, you know, here we are in 2020 and we're in the same place. So, you know, what was so different about these latest atrocities, atrocities have been happening for, you know, for hundreds of years in this country. Um, and so to address this person's comment, I think, I think, yes, I think um, that is one of the important things that I think is a real ally that you can do is you can dig deep and you can understand um, the historical um, hurt that takes time, um, that's oftentimes uncomfortable, it's painful, but I have some shared, um, some shared historical knowledge that we can then move together in unity and move the needle. And Dr. Amber, mm -hmm. I think to piggyback off of that, there's actually um, another comment and question from the chat too. Um, this one is from um, one of our guests who is a white woman and she describes herself as an ally wanting to do better. Um, she wonders exactly what can white people do to be a good ally? You know, she reads books and she educates herself. She reaches out to her black friends um, to find out what they're, you know, how they're doing. Um, and she's actively seeking out black businesses and social media accounts, but she says she still feels helpless. So I don't know if Dr. Michael has any other resources or suggestions for um, people who really are trying. Yeah, um, that's a pretty relative question. Um, and, you know, for someone who's not doing anything, that list may be overwhelming. For someone who isn't satisfied, I can understand where you may want to do more. Um, I just try to say that you want to you you want to stop seeing black people um, in this missionary place and see them as human beings who you want to embrace. And, and appreciate. So, you know, if, if I were a business owner, I want to make sure I have a diverse employee and a diverse staff. If I'm an administrator on my job and I'm talking about diversity, I want to have diversity at every level 
and throughout the ranks. And I want to speak diversity too. Um, if, if I want to attend to these groups, I have to let them permeate through everything that I do and not just have a face value. Um, my neighborhood needs to be reflective of more than one type of person or one, one group of people, um, as well as the schools that I attend. And when that's not the case, I need to be asking questions. Um, why isn't this so? What, what needs to be happening so that this is so? Um, and I need to just call out injustice at every possible chance. And I know we're talking about Black people, but the injustice needs to spread across um, all the different groups, all the various ethnicities and sexual orientations, um, because allies are allies, not just particular allies. Mm -hmm. I was talking to a colleague today and I said, you know, Dr. King didn't just say injustice in some places is a threat to justice everywhere. It's injustice anywhere. So um, that, that may be easier said than done and that may seem shallow, but it's still um, necessary and it's hard to maintain uh, over the long haul. So I would also um, add uh, to, on to what you were saying, Michael, is that you know, when in, in my workplace, oftentimes the 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 decisions um, around the, the the people to have the power and the spheres of influence most of the time do not look like me. Most of the time, they are white men in my profession, and so the white men who have um, who I have relationships with and who. Um, are asking what they um, can do, I encourage them to use their seat at the table that I do not have yet. Maybe one day I'll have it, but I don't have it yet. And so um, use your position of power to advocate and to speak up and to um, use your voice to diversify the workplace and all of the things you were saying. Use that position of, of influence and power because that those are positions that many um, many people of color or me as a black person, I don't have. I, I'm glad you brought that up because I think uh, maybe this last instance uh, with, with George Floyd has really brought the whole conversation of we need other people involved in this um, and we need to do this. Uh, we need to have a sustainable conversation. You know, six months from now, we need to be talking about inequality and injustice and, and not just in this hot bed moment. So, uh, yeah, I, I think that's spot on. Um, we definitely need to have multiple conversations at multiple levels with detail, again, over the next, over the, over the foreseeable future. So um, I want to circle back around to uh, Dr. Kristen, um, and um, I want to go back to uh, counseling, especially uh, in the Black community. And so I'm going to let Dr. Kristen go ahead and ask her question. Um, so Dr. Michael, I think you actually alluded to this a little bit earlier, um, but how have you and the counseling community tailored or altered your counseling methods in the era of Black Lives Matter and police brutality? Yeah. Um, so, one, I, I have the, the, the privilege and the benefit of working at a very socially conscious place. Um, we have conversations uh, in my institution that aren't that aren't had in other places, uh, and, and that's, that's unfortunate. So it's kind of easy for us to talk about issues or happenings that affect Black people that may not be commonplace in other, in other institutions. Um, and naturally, we focus our research in that direction, but we also have um, students that we're training to carry out or, or who have a, set, a similar professional outlook. Um, so, th so that's what we're doing, and we kind of we we kind of assertively um, 
put ourselves in the mainstream arena and say, this is what we're doing. This is what we should be doing. This is what we encourage others to do. Um, and, and so we have something called generational mentoring where, where our mentors are faculty members who are training their own PhD students who now have mentors. And so we can kind of see a lineage that's starting to be created uh, it sounds kind of diabolical, but it really isn't. Um, where we're just able to increase a message that's being heard. Now, I will say this. Um, we, we often caucus and get together and we check in and we support one another. Um, at one point, I was the only black male counselor educator in the state of Alabama. So my professional supports had to come two and three states over, but that's okay. In, in the age of the internet and the, and the uh, unlimited wireless cell phone usage plans, we're able to still be connected. And so we just take advantage of all that. And then we say, okay, you know, each one, teach one, bring one. Um, hey, what are you doing to groom yourself so that when this position becomes available, you can step into this place and now we can increase the capacity for having these conversations. So it's a little bit strategic, um, but that's, that's the unofficial official plan um, that we've been doing. I think the counseling profession is catching up to making these conversations more mainstream. Um, we're publishing more about topics that affect certain groups directly, um, like police brutality, um, the effects of police brutality on black fatherhood or black families is coming up. It, it's starting to, to manifest. It's a little slow. Uh, I personally would like to see it, see the reaction be quicker, but there are other ways of doing that, like this medium. Um, there's a similar meeting going on right now with the Counselors for Social Justice, uh, where we are actively speaking about the lives of George Floyd and, um, Brianna Taylor and Amon Arbery. So it's it's happening. It's just not. It's not. It hasn't been formally endorsed or endorsed the way I would have wanted it to be. So one of the things from the chat was you, um, Dr. Amber and Dr. Michael, both had talked about um, hiring African Americans, but also how some of our um, white colleagues can help us is by mentoring African Americans to get them in higher positions, and so. Um, if you're looking for a way to help in this fight, mentoring, you know, I was blessed with two wonderful um, deans who were white women who have helped pull me along as I've gone through my career. And so that is an excellent mm -hmm. way to be a mentor. So yeah. I think Dr. Lakeisha had Absolutely. something. Yeah. yeah, just three quick points uh, just to address some of the commentators or sorry, some of the comments who were questioning, what can you do? Um, just three things. So to piggyback off Dr. Tamika in terms of mentoring, I think mentoring is great, uh, but I also think you should take it a step further. And instead of merely mentoring, be a sponsor, be an advocate for that person, because you can mentor and show that person sort of the way of the land with respect to that specific position, but to sponsor someone in addition to mentoring them. For example, if you hear about a position in which the person that you're mentoring would be a good fit for, mention their name, support them, uh, you know, put their name at the table when perhaps you guys are trying to find the next, you know, I don't know, um, manager or what have you. So mentor, but also advocate and sponsor that person. And then secondly, with respect to what you can do, um, resources in terms of monetary resources are important. Just to give you an example of the haves and have nots uh, with respect to COVID-19, my mother as well as Dr. Michael's mother are educators and they've been educators for over 30 years. When COVID-19 happened, what did we do? We homeschool. Uh, the four, uh, the three KMD doctors and myself, we have the luxury and I call it a luxury 
of being able to homeschool our children on laptops, on computers, on iPads, with Wi-Fi in our home. Well, there are some children who, number one, the school does not have the resources to provide them with an iPad or a laptop or something to take home. And then if the school does have that resource, guess who doesn't have Wi-Fi in their home to be able to even log in to do the work? that student. So there are a lot of things that sort of transpired and came about with respect to just COVID-19 where we recognize advantages versus disadvantages. So resources, mm -hmm. find a school that doesn't have a computer program or find a school in which children are sharing books. There's no reason why children should be sharing books. Find maybe a community that um, has a boys and girls club and maybe their Wi-Fi isn't working. There are tangible, practical things that you can find to put your money towards as opposed to just putting it in a general GoFundMe and you don't know what's going to happen to it. And then thirdly, perspective. You know, change your perspective on how you how you view Black people, um, with us being physicians and, and clinicians and professors, um, you most likely would view us, I'm making assumptions and generalizations here, which is not appropriate, but to illustrate a point, um, it's easier to approach us and not prejudge us because of the professions that we are in. Um, however, if I was in sweatpants at the grocery store in CVS, um, I still have eyes following me as if I'm going to lift something. So my external clothing and my environment should not dictate whether I'm judged or not. Another classic example, my husband um, is a retired professional football player, and so the tears and the children and the grown men who run up to him in the past to get an autograph are the same men who would look at him if he's in sweats and a hoodie and walk the other way. So check your perceptions and perspectives. Yeah. Um, so, so we, really um, have, we have a... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Amber. <laughs> I think you're going to well, say the same question I was going to do. Yeah, because so, I was really excited to see that there's a medical school student on here. So I'll let you take it away, Tamika. All right. So we have a medical student on, and she had a question, and she was like, how do you confront racism in the workplace, especially from patients? And she's also a minority. She's not an African-American, but she's also a minority. So how how can she handle confronting racism in the workplace, especially from patients that are she's going to see? I think that's a hard one. I think that um, one of the things you have to do is be free to engage your attending. And if they're not up for it, you find a minority mentor that you can go to to talk about these issues, how you can better handle it um, in the future. It's one of those really tricky balances that is, is even hard for me in my career. I've been mm -hmm. practicing medicine for 15 years now, and it's even hard for me to, to handle dealing with patients who are inappropriate, whether they be sexually or racially inappropriate. And I think I just, I tend to be very honest and I call a spade a spade and I will call you a patient out on it and say, that's not something I'm willing to deal with. And either they'll want to stay with me as, a, as their doctor or they won't. Um, it's harder for a medical student and as a resident because you're going to see that and you, it's not going to go away. Um, but I think that's why you have attendings. And if your attendings won't do anything, then you have mentors and other minorities that you should be able to go to and say, hey, this is not okay. And if you don't have diversity at your program, you want to make sure you go to your leaders of your pro program, your deans. You know, the changes that we made in diversity at our at Indiana University is literally because of our students. Our students are very vocal and they go to the deans and they say, hey, this is not acceptable for us. And I'm blessed to have students. You know, I think this generation is going to change the world. I, I say that a lot, but mm -hmm. you guys are vocal and you guys are honest. And I, I feel like you guys are going to come up with solutions to help with this problem as time goes on. So I would encourage you. Um, that person who um, asked this question, um, I would encourage you. So I have won over my most racist patients with compassion and competency. Most people are not going to argue with compassion 
and competency. So one example, um, I had a patient and I walked into the room, white man, and older white man, and literally the blood left his face. He turned like a ghost. And he looked at me and I looked at him and he said, I thought you were going to be a man. And I said, surprise. Um, and I know what he really was trying to say. Like, not only did I think you were going to be a man, I thought you were going to be a white man. So I just kind of like blew his whole world up. Um, and so we, you know, we paused and I said, you know, do you still want to continue on um, with the consultation? And he did. And I, you know, I said, I was I'm going to gather some information with him and so we could come up with a plan to treat his pain. Um, and then by the end of the conversation, he was smiling. And, you know, I, I think I, I think it was an overall good experience. Um, all of us who practice medicine have ha probably um, um, on this call, because I see several um, several African-American physicians on the Zoom have had countless stories of patients who, um, who have said ignorant things. When I was a medical school student working at the VA, um, a patient, a veteran needed um, a blood transfusion, and he told us that we, uh, that we could give him a blood transfusion as long as it wasn't monkey blood. And we looked at him, and so that meant that he did not want to receive a black person's blood. Um, and so sometimes, um, you know, sometimes you, you don't know what to say in those circumstances, but I always try to bring it back to, you know, like, I'm going to treat you with, um, with, you know, the best care. Um, I always try to be compassionate and try to be confident. And when things, when things cross a line, as a student, that's when you have superiors that are there to, to help you out and to help you navigate those, those tough situations. Was I supposed to respond? I, I couldn't tell. Um, you may you may respond. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, I, I think I would, you know, I, I must say, uh, I think what medical school students are about what twenty two to twenty five on average. Is that is that fair? So I, I think I think you know mid forties, Michael is going to have a different perspective than mid twenties, Michael. I, I think I would be caught off guard by just blatant racism. And I would, I, I would probably just have my hands up in the air and try to make peace. But I think, uh, I think I'm a little more secure in who I am in my mid forties. So I've kind of mastered the, the one statement reply. Like, do you mind repeating that? Like kind of like, <laughs> Can you say that one more time again? Because I think generally people won't repeat the same racist thing twice. And if they do, they kind of double down. Then I just say, you know, everybody doesn't think like that. And then just keep on about my business. Right. Or I just say, well, you know, that's a kind of narrow view. Hopefully you'll open that up to other perspectives later on in your life. But I don't really engage in the back and forth. I kind of just... A, a one line, one kind of response, and then it's on to the next thing. And, I, and my hope is that there's enough in that statement to leave them with something to think about. Maybe they, they come back later um, with, you know, you said something last time. And if they don't, that's fine. But um, I think the most important thing is that you say something and you don't, you don't ignore what sex. I, again, if you don't say anything. It's kind of like you co-sign on the behavior. But if you say something like, you, did, you just didn't say what I thought you just said and, and just keep moving or you, you didn't mean that and, and kind of keep going. Um, at least people know that, that what they said was foul and it needs to be um, reevaluated. Now, whether or not it's your job to do it is something different, but at least you let them know I heard you and I don't approve of what you said. So Dr. Michael, we had a question that was sent to me privately um, that said they still don't really know how to deal with the Amy Coopers at their job when they are blatantly, um, they act as if they're an advocate at times, but at other times you know that they're undermining your work. 
um, as a black person. And so they, they want help and tips on how to deal with that. Okay. So Mike, can you also give some background on the Amy Cooper um, situation? Um, the false accusation, <laughs> um, uh, Amy Cooper was a uh, uh, Karen in the park. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. Um, you know, so let me get the question right. Amy Cooper at the job. Is that what this is about? Yeah. So for those of us who don't, don't know this story, so this was a, um, a situation in which a black man was in Central Park. He was doing some bird watching. Um, a lady, a white woman had her dog um, off leash and he asked her to put the dog on the leash per the requirements of this part of Central Park um, and there was um, some words back and forth and she um, told him I am going to call the police and she did and say um, um, an African American I don't remember what she said like an African American man um, is it is bothering. I don't know what the words that she said, but it basically she made a false accusation against him for something that she had no business doing, having the dog off leash. Yeah, the reality is history is laced with black people being falsely accused of doing crimes that they didn't commit, and also the police believing them. I mean, the whole concept of the slave patrol is is based in if I see you doing wrong and I want you to do wrong, then you will do wrong. And Jim Crow is all about. If I see you advancing, I'm going to change the rules and move the goalposts so I can keep you at bay. So that's 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 the, the Amy Cooper isn't new. I think I think if I could get to the question, is if I observe it or if someone tells me this happened, I, I think I think what you do is you understand that this could there could be truth to this. Um, this person may not be lying. If, I think you have to kind of at least know something about their character. Um, so you can say, you know, this sounds out of place. This sounds like something that may be falsified. I guess if you, if you want to be, if you want to be a friend or if you want to be an ally, you could dig and investigate on your own and kind of say, Hey, what's up with this? It sounds, this sounds kind of appropriate. Um, it, it, it's hard. And that's, and that's kind of like the underlying basis of privilege is I can, I can blow a whistle, and and I know that I'm going to be attended to, and, and you're going to receive uh, the, the the negative end of the stick. Um, I do want to talk about confrontation for a minute because that's come up in this question the question before. You know, a confrontation is just about you pointing out inconsistencies. It, that's all it is. It's not about you being adversarial. So I hear you saying that, you know. Um, someone attacked you, yet I don't see any physical evidence of that, nor do I see, you know, whatever it is you want to say beyond that. Can you kind of help me out with that? And I think that's when the, the person either is going to back up or double down on another lie or just confess. But I think that's, that may be some of the things that, that someone may want to work on developing. But this is all a part of the skill building and being an ally too and, and the process of, of committing to that. So um, I, I know that we have, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Amber. So I know that um, we are, we are um, past the hour mark and we are glad to um, continue to entertain questions um, as they come in, but by no means are we holding anyone hostage here. But I wanted to circle back around from an earlier comment um, from Johnny. And, you know, he said, he said, maybe we should reconsider um, the title of a discussion like this. Maybe we should, instead of saying we're not okay we should say we are okay, um, and his, you know, the notion is to focus on first 
self, you know, first in a self-affirming way that we are okay. It's our world, our reality that is not, um, and that then keeps the focus on where the problem lies with with racial injustice in this country. I'm interested to hear what um, what um, Dr. Michael and others might think about that. I think a renaming, um, well, I think it makes it or a reframe, a, 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 an asset based or asset focused type of discussion. Uh, I think you normalize um, that it's okay to be upset because some upsetting things have happened. Um, so I kind of, I kind of like, I, I like the thought. Um, we need to know that you should be angry if you're dealing with you know, 400 years and some change of oppression. You, you should be angry if you're telling people, the police, some police, some police don't play by the rules and you finally get something that's, that's, that's substantial, yet it's still traumatic and painful. So, and, and I wanna lash out at that. That's, that's totally okay. Um, uh, and you can go even a step further and say, you know, why don't we have mass depression or why don't we have mass suicides given the level of PTSD that black folks have been exposed to? What is it about us that allows us to persevere and still find a way to say, we're gonna be okay even in the future? Um, but maybe that's, that's the follow up. Any other um, any other questions um, or, or comments? I, I know that um, uh, people uh, have other things to attend to this um, tonight, but I want to want to thank everyone for their openness, for their willingness to listen, to be a part of these important conversations and discussions, um, and to just encourage everyone on the line um, that, you know, this is just the beginning. Uh, I personally um, have a glass half full perspective on this. I think we've got some really um, important, we've, we've built some really important momentum and the key is to continue this, um, especially into, uh, as we move into election time uh, in November. So um, I am, I am encouraged. So Amber, there are a couple of questions if you want, my computer keeps freezing if you want to take a look at those. Yeah, absolutely. So there is um, one from another one that says, um, so it's a comment so that, you know, I want folks to respect the idea that I'm not okay. We don't always have to be super black women and super black men. Um, we need help, we need counseling, we need self care. Many don't want to admit that. Um, and she says, I like the name, I believe in Jesus, but I am, I am not him, I am not okay. Um, the name works for me. So, <laughs> so thank you for, um, for that comment. Um, you know, she brings up a really good um, important point um, myself and Dr. Tamika, Dr. Kristen, and Dr. Lakeisha, we talk a lot about the superwoman complex, um, and we actually have um, an episode that we'll um, release later on where we talk about this very thing, and do we embrace this idea of the superwoman complex um, as, a, as a black woman? Um, it has a lot of historical, um, historical roots in that name, so that's a, a, another conversation for a later time. Um, we've got one more um, question, and this one is for, um, for Dr. Michael. How would you counsel um, our youth who may be feeling a sense of hopelessness? So we talked about how to support our youth who are out there um, advocating and marching and protesting and fighting. How would you how would you counsel youth who are, are who are just feeling really hopeless right now? I mean, because yeah. I think it's worth in, you know worth mentioning that. You know, kind of like we've had a double pandemic, a double whammy. We've got, we've had COVID and then all of a sudden, then we had this, you know, string of, of 
you know, police brutality events. So how do, how do we counsel our, our children when they're not okay? Yeah, so I, I uh, you know, given rapport and, and all the other details that need to be fleshed out, I would, I would go to the Montgomery bus boycott. Um, that lasted for, I think it was 13 or 14 months. Um, the entire city of Montgomery had to be committed to it. And everything that led up into that decision probably mimicked what's going on now. Um, and people made a, made a conscious economic decision that they were going to hold fast and there were going to be consequences for misstepping. And I, and I would say, you know, I mean, there are plenty of, of historical uh, transcriptions that speak to what someone's daily life was like during the, must, during the boycott, but somehow people got through that and they had to persevere and they had to see it through and they had to lean on each other. But that's where, that, that's, that's what I immediately go to. Um, and that's what I would say to, to even people today, we, we need a plan that in, in lieu of hopelessness, that's sustainable. And I think the, the, the 60s boycott is an excellent one that we could go to. Al Sharpton speaks to, we didn't have cell phones, we didn't have, <laughs> he said beep was at the time, but we didn't have all these communication devices, but yet we organized something that lasted and worked. And, and now we can't get a neighborhood association meeting together. So there's a lot that we can still do with the resources that we have. Um, and it's historically documented. I think the other thing with our youth, especially is that we allow them to be heard. Sometimes it's all about them understanding that we are not saying you have to fight like we fought, but also that they are heard. Because I think that one of the things as now somebody who they consider an elder at Spelman, you know, we go back and forth with our youth, but they just want us to know that they're there. They, they are there and they're fighting. And as long as we hear them and support them, that's what they need. Well, thank you all, everyone, for joining us. We so appreciate um, your willingness to take this time out of your evening um, and to listen and to engage. And we will have, I'm, I'm sure there will be other um, important discussions. And um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. We, we are appreciate, we really appreciate you. And Thanks to my better half for um, letting me uh, volunteer tell him to do something. <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Michael. And thank you guys for joining us. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed it.